Hey, howdy. I'm Joe P., and I am a tour guide at the Evil Knievel Museum, where I meet super interesting people and get inspired every week. And I thought I'd introduce you to some daredevils and some stuntmen, Evil Knievel's contemporaries and his protégés, some other fans like us, and collectors. Future episodes will include a, an expert on Las Vegas history. He's great. A golf buddy whose innovation really took off. And I'll take you along to witness the acquisition of a very special motorcycle. Together we can construct displays and restore vehicles as we are building a new museum as we speak. And we'll talk to the founders and the staff of the museum. We'll be discussing courage and inspiration, hopefully with some intriguing guests. Or, or maybe just me if I can't hoodwink anybody else to do it. But whatever the case is, I hope that you'll feel empowered to take on whatever life is throwing at you right now. Today, I want to introduce you to a daredevil in his own right. He's earned the designation by pushing his own adventures a little bit too far. You often think of sports mascots as human cartoons. You know, they lament bad calls or they're shooting t-shirts from a cannon. But Dan Mears takes his craft to a higher, more treacherous level. He is better known as Casey Wolf around these parts and around the world. He's a Super Bowl champion. He's got the ring and he's a bona fide stuntman and has an inspirational story. Well, thank you for having me on today. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I'm the uh, guy with the alter ego. Got to, uh, you know, I go by Dan Mears during the day, and then a lot of times I go by Casey Wolf too. So I, I look at look a little different in costume and I smell a lot different in costume. So, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I was, I, I, a lot of people always ask how I, how I got my start as a mascot. It's, this isn't exactly something where back in third grade, I thought I'd grow up to be a mascot, but I, I'd never been a mascot until I went to college, went to college at the university of Missouri in Columbia and, and one day I was just sitting around reading the school newspaper. They said they were going to have tryouts to be the tiger. And I thought that sounds kind of interesting. So I went to this meeting and, and then I tried out and got the job. And for the next four years, I ran around all over the United States doing college football, basketball games, other sporting events, and had a lot of fun doing it. And then once I graduated from college, when I got my first job working in professional baseball, for the uh, St. Louis Cardinals ran around in a bird suit in St. Louis. That was fun. But then the Kansas city chiefs called me and offered me this new position that they were starting up a character called KC Wool. And, you know, in professional baseball, they play 81 home games a year during the summertime professional football. They play 10 home games a year in the fall and the winter. And I might not be the brightest guy around, but I knew that was a good switch to make to the NFL. And so I, Accepted the job with Kansas City Chiefs, and I've been with them now for the past 33 seasons. So you got out of the tights. Got out of the yellow tights, and the yeah, the bird had to wear yellow tights and had the bird feathers. And I'm like, yeah, I think I'll look better in gray fur to us. And so I took the job in Kansas City, and I'm glad I did. I've been there for 33 years and absolutely love working for the Kansas City Chiefs. They're just a great organization. And they, that do a lot, you know, they're not only committed to winning on the field, but they do a lot in the community as well. And that's what I appreciate working for them. So they're always, uh, you know, we're always giving back and doing a lot of stuff with uh, community events and, and charities and homeless shelters and soup kitchens and all kinds of good stuff that they're involved with. Yeah, it's pretty Pretty neat. We take that for granted. I mean, I just grew up. I thought all NFL teams were like that, but it's not true. The Chiefs are a really special organization in that in that regard. They are. They, uh, I can't say enough good things about them. I've worked for them for 33 years. I don't just say nice things about them because they give me a check twice a month. Either. <laughs> uh, I'd be a fan even if I didn't work for them. I'd be a fan of the Chiefs because they're just, like I said, the ownership, the Hunt family, uh Lamar Hunt, if you ever got to meet Lamar Hunt, was just a fantastic guy. And, and uh, Clark Hunt, is, uh, as they say, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree in that family because that, everybody in that family just love them and uh, just appreciate how they use their influence to make a positive impact, not only in Kansas City, but throughout the Midwest and around the country. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. They make a positive impact. Was one of them the one that made the decision to create a Casey Wolf character? You know, I, th- I think that started right after Carl Peterson. Uh, the, if you remember, Carl Peterson took over as the general manager. Him and uh, Marty Schottenheimer both got to Kansas City about the same time. They were doing a lot of new things, like the public relations and marketing folks decided that they wanted to do a new uh, costume character, Casey Wolf. And so uh, that's where the idea came from. I started with the Chiefs in the 1990 season, which was Marty Schottenheimer's second season in Kansas City. Marty was there for 10 or 11 years, I think. Mm. I mean, the '90s were good years in Kansas City. We went to the we went to the playoffs. I think every year for nine years. It, it was fun working for the Chiefs, and and then the character it just continued to grow and uh, just become more and more popular, and so it it really took off in the '90s, and it hasn't slowed down a whole lot. I still stay very busy, especially after you win a couple Super Bowls. Then you get a lot of requests for, you know, we do birthdays and wedding receptions and grocery stores and banks and uh, parades and festivals and you name it. Mm. So it was, there's never a shortage of things to do. And then interviews in the car between the stops. <laughs> That's right. So and then the interviews in the car. I travel a lot. So I, the next three months, I think I will add it up. I think I'm in 13 different states in the next three months. And so there's never a shortage of things to do. Yeah. Well, sorry about bothering you right after your big, huge Super Bowl win, but I would have bothered you anyway because because of the story that you've got. You know, it's it's not my fault that you guys keep keep winning. I, That's right. You keep it new, and you just told me that you played Evil Knievel, which is pretty fascinating. I don't. Yeah. I don't think I've seen that before. They were just skits and stunts. A lot of times I'd dress up one of my friends like he was from the opposing team. And then Casey Wolf would ride out on like a Harley Davidson motorcycle with a leather jacket and sunglasses on. And then I'd get off and beat up the guy, my friend, (laughs) that was dressed up like the other team. And so it always made me look like the hero or the tough guy there at Arrowhead Stadium. And so, but yeah, one of those skits we did, and I can't even, I'd have to go back and look. I bet it's been... 15 years ago, we did an evil Knievel skit where we built this little ramp and then we uh, put fireworks off on the side of the ramp. And then we laid some these little, like, basically dolls, but they're big dolls. And uh, we laid them out, dressed up like the other team, like I was trying to jump them, mm-hmm. my mini bike. Mm-hmm. And then I'd get down to the very end of the, the field and they'd play some dramatic music, and I'd come, you know, as fast as a mini bike would go. I was, I was probably only traveling 15 miles an hour tops, maybe 10. <laughs> and, and so I'd come off that ramp, and then we'd detonate the fireworks. So there was just a big loud boom and a lot of smoke just to make it look dramatic. And then I never would clear all the dummies. I'd usually lay in the back tire, the third <laughs> one that was laying there. And so it looked like I was jumping and then landed on the opposing team. And so, it was a it was a lot of fun. The crowd always, as you know, they always love the the stunts and the jumping off a ramp on a motorcycle. Dan, were you able to land on a doll without crashing? I did, yeah. <laughs> so that ramp wasn't too huge, but it was uh it was probably eighteen inches, twenty four inches off the ground. And so we I I got a little bit of distance, but when you're only traveling at ten miles an hour, I was giving it top speed, but <laughs> yes. you know this little mini bike and I'm in a wolf suit that's got 85 inch hips. And so it's not like I'm aerodynamic, mm-hmm. but yeah, we had, we had a lot of fun designing that skit and, and the crowd seemed to enjoy it. Actually, I think I've got a picture of that in my first, either my first or my second book is a picture of Casey Wolf dressed up like evil can evil coming off that ramp. Okay, well, I've got that so, first book, so I'll look it up. If you got that first book, you look through all those pictures, and I'm almost sure there is a picture of Casey Wolf dressed up like Evil Knievel jumping. Have so, you ever taken a spill? Yeah, I wiped out. Well, I, I made these things. I took a took a water ski 
and I put uh, basically roller skate wheels underneath of it, and then threw a rope handle, you know, like a ski rope, tied it behind a four wheeler, and then I had my buddy pull me behind the four wheeler on these uh, on these water skis, and we called it redneck water skiing, <laughs> and I did it at Arrowhead Stadium out in the parking lot. And that were, it worked great until the we till the ball bearings or the wheels got too hot. They were like a hard plastic or the hard rubber wheels. Well, apparently we were going a little too fast because the ball bearings got hot, which melted the wheel, which then caused it to start start to wobble mm. while I was traveling. And next thing you know, I was uh, I was flying through the air and uh, yeah, skinned up my arm and my legs and drew a little blood, but. Boy, I got a great story to tell, though. I'm a tough guy. Yeah. I don't know if I'm tough or not, but my wife tells me there's a fine line, courage and stupidity. So, and I I might step over that line a time or two. So, (laughs) oh, I love that. I'm going to credit your wife because I'm going to repeat that there's a fine line between (laughs) courage and stupidity. (laughs) Uh, So great. And then you took a big spill November 23rd. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the day I took my biggest spill. We were uh, going to do a stunt at Arrowhead Stadium where Casey Wolf was going to uh, bungee jump and zip line into the stadium. And we had done the zip line before. It's basically we hire a company that comes in, they set up a zip line that stretches from one side of the the lights at the top of the stadium. They attach it to the lights at the top, and then they stretch it all the way across the field to the lights on the other side of the stadium. And I'd go up, I'd jump out of the lights, and then I'd zip line out across the field. Well, the crowd loved it, and so we decided to do it again a few months later. But we didn't want to do the same thing, so we thought we'd bungee jump and zip line. So I was going to jump out of the lights. It's supposed to fall about 20 feet. The bungee cord was supposed to catch me and then bounce me back into the air, and I was going to zip line out over the field. Well, things didn't go so well because then. They they had too much slack in the zip line, and uh, so when I jumped out of the lights, instead of falling twenty feet up, though approximately seventy to seventy five feet, mm. I hit the seats in the upper level of our stadium. Hit the seats so hard to knock two seats out of the concrete. So if you ever go to Arrowhead, swing by section three twenty four row thirty two, seats twenty two and twenty three. Those look a little bit newer. That was thanks to me because I mm. knocked them out of the concrete, mm. but. Uh, I ended up, uh, not only did I damage the seats, they did a pretty good job on my body, too. I broke seven ribs, collapsed a lung, shattered my tailbone, cracked my sacrum, uh, got a big gash on the back of my left leg that required stitches, got several units of blood because I'd lost a lot of blood after I'd hit the seats. But then my worst injury, I broke the T12 vertebrae in my back, and I now got these titanium rods in my back that help stabilize that part of my spine. So I spent nine days in the hospital and six months off work doing therapy and rehab. And uh, yeah, that was, that's my, that's my biggest spill in my, uh, in my mascot career. Mm -hmm. Did that knock you unconscious? It did not. So I was, uh, I was wait for the whole thing. There's times I look back and I wish I would have been knocked unconscious, but uh, Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember the whole thing. Heights never used to bother me too much, but I don't like them quite as much anymore. You were awake, and I assume they just can't get you off of of that line, right? Are you dangling? If you're you're bungee jump and zip line, there's no way to get down halfway through their eye. So what happened after I hit the seats, the bungee cord then yanked me back into the air again, and then I zip lined out across the field. So I had to finish the, the ride, and then they lowered me to the ground. I think they knew that something was wrong because I, you know, uh, there's a, I hate to get too graphic, but there was a puddle of blood down on the field where I, I was, uh, they were lowering me. I was really struggling to breathe because of my collapsed left lung. Plus, I had the harness on my body, which made it even, you know, those harnesses fit really tight. Of course, you want them to fit tight. So I was really struggling to breathe. And so I finally got on the ground. Thankfully, our grounds crew was there because it was a practice. We were practicing. This was the day before the game. But the grounds crew was there. 
it's those guys helped to cut this harness off of me, which helped me. I mean, I, I was still struggling to breathe, but at least I could breathe a little bit more. And then basically laid there for about uh, 15 minutes waiting for the ambulance to show up. And when they got there, they loaded me up and hauled me to the emergency room, started doing CAT scans and x-rays and checking me out from head to toe and inside out. That's when they discovered all the different injuries I had. So like I said, it's nine days in a hospital and yeah, it gave me a whole new appreciation for doctors and nurses and Mm -hmm. healthcare professionals and physical therapists. And they're the ones that helped me get back to where I'm at today. And I, I still live with, there's, there's no fun, but uh, hey, at least I'm alive. And I, I remember when the doctor left my hospital room the night after my uh, accident, I remember him looking at me and saying, Mr. Mears, he said, I hope you realize that you're an extremely lucky man. He said, if you fell 75 feet, he said, Number one, you're lucky you're still alive. But number two, you're very lucky you're not paralyzed right now. And that night in the hospital, I thought a lot about what that doctor said. I thought about my life, thought a whole lot about, you know, how I was choosing to live life each and every day. Learned a lot of important life lessons when you uh, just about lose your life. You know, it puts life in perspective in a hurry. One of the things that I, I believe is I've always told my kids this, that there's no such thing as accidents. They're all just incidents in God's perfect plan for my life. And I do believe that, that, uh, that God knew this was going to happen to me. Now, that's not the story I would have picked for myself in life, but at least I knew God must have a purpose and a plan behind this, uh, or it would have never happened in my life. Because I know that, I know he loves me and I know he's got a plan for my life. And even though I didn't understand it, didn't really like it, I knew that in the long run that uh, something good would come out of it. My faith plays a big part in who I am. It's the uh, most important thing in my life. Casey Wolf's just what I do. Casey Wolf's not who I am. You know, I tell people who I am first and foremost. Is I'm, a, I'm a child of God. I'm a I'm Christ follower. And so as a result of that, my, my faith is what I've, I've built my life on. And so it, even though it wasn't an easy journey to walk through. I look back on it now and I just see some of the lessons that I learned not to take people for granted. You know, my mom used to tell me this in high school, that the most important things in life aren't things. The most important things in life are relationships. And at, uh, during this time is when I realized my mom's pretty smart gal because as I laid in the hospital, not once did I think about how big my house was, how nice my car was, or whether I had the latest smartphone or not, you know, mm -hmm. would help me get through nine days in the hospital and six months of very painful therapy and rehab were three things. And that was my faith, my family, and my friends. And all three of those things are relationships, you know, my relationship with the Lord, relationship with my wife, my kids, my parents, my in-laws, and then finally relationship with others. And, you know, I, I've always heard that it's the banana that gets created from the bunch. That's the first one that gets and uh, meaning that life's a team sport. We need each other. And that's what helped me get through those difficult days in my life is it, just the people that were there to support me and encourage me, even on, on the days where I uh, was kind of down and frustrated. And, and I knew that God had put those people in my life to get me through those difficult times. So now I'm able to go out and share that with others. You know, I speak in a lot of uh, a lot of different conferences around the country. We do a lot of uh, businesses and uh, churches and schools and nursing homes and just try to go out and encourage others that no matter how difficult this life gets at times, you, you always remember that the most important things in life aren't things. The most important things in life are those relationships. And that's what gets us through the difficult times. Yeah, isn't that amazing? When I... We, we think and we give a lot of credit to doctors and nurses and ambulance drivers, but it's not often that we hear stories about the, I, I don't want to call them little people, but you just don't expect the grounds crew to come, come running to your aid. Oh, yeah. And even when I was in the hospital, I remember them. some of the people who, who encouraged me the most were the lady that would bring in my meals or the the custodian that was there to help 
clean my room or, you know, and uh, they were just friendly. I mean, came in with a smile on their face, and talked. We talked and chatted. And they, you know, sometimes it's those little things in life that help people get through the difficult days. And that's that's what I try to encourage people with now is, you know, on my desk at Arrowhead, I've got a quote that says, life's like a coin. You can spend it any way you wish, but you're only going to spend it one time. So spend it wisely. And I love that quote because it reminds me that every day I get to make choices. I get to choose how I'm going to live life. I get to choose how I'm going to spend my coin. And uh, I've learned that when you, uh, you know, in, in life, you can, you can do two things with money. You can spend or invest it. Money you spend, you never see it again. Money you invest, that's wise. That's, that'll eventually multiply and return to you. When you think about it, we do the same thing with our lives. You're either going to spend it or invest it. And a life that's just spent selfishly is wasted. But a life that's invested in helping others, encouraging others, that right there bears fruit for a long, long time. So that's what I try to do each day. Just remember that in my choices, I try to try to live as an investor and look for opportunities to make a positive impact in the lives of others. Yeah, that's truly inspirational, Dan. I, just, I don't know what to say. I, you, it, it, it comes a, from somewhere. I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a rewarding way to live life. I do know that because I look back on my career and I've been done this now for 33 years. And yeah, the Super Bowls are cool. And, you know, the Super Bowl rings are real cool and great memories. But I tell you, this stuff that I'll, I'll remember uh, the most when this the whole crazy mascot career of mine is finished are just the relationships I've built with people. And some of the trips, you know, I do a lot of work now. Uh, some people know that all the money I make off of book sales, I donate that to charity, do a lot with orphanages around the world. And so I've got to, I've got to travel around the world, just going and visiting different orphanages and been to Africa and the Philippines and uh, India and Honduras and just Haiti and just all over the, the world. And those are some of the most rewarding trips I've taken is just seeing the faces of those kids light up when Casey Wolf comes walking into their <laughs> village or into their orphanage. That's the rewarding part of the job right there. Oh, man. That sounds hot. <laughs> yes, it is hot. Yes. A lot of those countries I visit, there's no such thing as air conditioning, at least the places I go to. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, it's it's fun though. Well worth it. Dan, you are making a positive impact on other people's lives. I think that's great. Thanks for sharing about the the mission work that you're doing. <clears throat> I mean, do you call yeah, it mission work? I do. I mean, I yeah, I don't, I don't care what you call it as long <laughs> as I can support it. That's all I care about. So yeah, I, I work with Bob four or five different ministries or organizations that support orphans around the world. One called Global Orphan Project, which is based out of Kansas City, just a great group. Uh, do another one with uh, one called Hope Givers that's based out of Georgia. And then Life Song, and then do some work with a, a ministry called Convoy of Hope, which is based out of Springfield, Missouri. And uh, But yeah, just a lot of great organizations out there doing a lot of great work and my job's easy. I just write books and then I sell those books and give the money away. I am not going to say I'm a great author, but I do have interesting stories just with all these, you know, I've walked women down the aisle on their wedding. I've been best man in weddings and just got all kinds of crazy mascot stories. And so I just put those stories into book form, throw a bunch of Casey Wolf fun photos in there and, and sell the books and, you know, all that money goes to goes to charity and the other good things. And that's what's fun about it. Well, I feel even better about reading that book now that I know it goes to a there good cause. Go. I, I read going to a good cause. <laughs> I read Wolves Can't Fly. What's the name of your newer book? But the second book I wrote is called Mascot on a Mission, mm -hmm. Living a Life of Influence. And it's got a lot of stories from all these different trips I've taken to different countries around the world and that just a bunch of, and we just added three new chapters to that book as well with uh, Super Bowl stories and Super Bowl pictures, because that book came out in December of 2019 for the first time. And then the Chiefs won the Super Bowl in February of 2020. So like two months later, and then so when we, we sold all the first 
I think we'd ordered like 5,000. We sold those 5,000. Before we printed the new ones, we're like, let's see if the Chiefs, uh, you know, we'd already won Super Bowl 54. We'd lost Super Bowl 55. And, we're, and we were getting close to Super Bowl 56 or, or Super Bowl 57. I'm sorry. So we're like, let's wait and see what the Chiefs do. Well, sure enough, they win the Super Bowl again this year. So I had to hurry up for another chapter. How many Super Bowl rings do you have? I've got two Super Bowl rings and a, uh, well, one. I'm getting another one here in a few months, I think. And then I've got an AFC championship ring from Super Bowl 55 when we lost to the Buccaneers. Are you going to make a great big one for the Wolf? Oh, yeah. I've got one for... I've got one for the wolf from Super Bowl Fifty Four, but I can't get the you can't get the next one made until uh, I find out what it's going to look like. Till I get the real one from the Chiefs, I all we do is we take a bunch of pictures of it, send it to a three D printer, and then they design it for us. That'll fit the wolf wolf finger. Speaking of the yeah, Super Bowl, I, I want to ask you one another question about the Super Bowl. How much leeway do you have as a mascot t- for the skits that you do at the Super Bowl? Super Bowl, not much, because that is pretty much dictated by the NFL. As a matter of fact, like an Arrowhead Stadium, I can pretty much go anywhere I want to as long as I stay off the field during the game itself. Mm-hmm. The Super Bowl is nothing like that. I cannot go up into the stands at all. And the only place I can run around is on the chief sideline and and the Chiefs end zone. So one the end zone was painted with Philadelphia Eagles colors. One was painted with Kansas City Chiefs. <laughs> and so I could only go behind the Chiefs side and the Chiefs side line. So, so when they kick that final field goal, you know, with what, eight seconds left this year, uh, unfortunately, he was kicking into the Philadelphia end zone. So I couldn't get out there under the goal like I usually do. They put my man on a leash. Dang. Yeah, tell me about it. I'm like, what the world? So, but yeah. But the reason I'm asking is because next Super Bowl is in Las Vegas. Yes. So I was wondering if you were going to be Elvis or if you're going to be Evil Knievel. You know what? I'm not sure what I'll bring. I get an Elvis outfit. I've got an Evil Knievel outfit. Even. I'll probably be both of them because I'm usually there. Like I was at the Super Bowl for eight days. Super Bowl was on the 12th went out on the fifth so the week before and then we do all kinds of appearances you know for good morning america and inside edition and fox and friends and all kinds of community and other nfl events and so um, and then i come home the day after the game oh man and then parade time and then parade yeah you get one day off and then you gotta then you head for the parade so. So, so great and you don't get to do away games other than super bowl is that correct not. Uh, once in a while, we do have one overseas game in Germany this year. And then once in a great while, they'll take me on the road. But typically, it's uh, all, it, they typically leave me in town to do watch parties and other events. Well, I hope you get to go to Las Vegas in February of 2024. Hey, me too. <laughs> okay. I, before I let you go, I said I was going to put you on the spot. And I don't know if you can do it or not since you're not in your office. But... It sounded like that you had a poem that hung on your wall, and I think it was at your office at Arrowhead, but it might be your office at home. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. The one I read every morning? Yeah. Can you give yeah. it a shot? I can give it a shot. So it says this. It says, this is the beginning of a brand new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it or I can use it for good. Well, what I do on this day is important because I'm exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day is going to be gone forever, leaving in its place something I've traded for it. I want it to be gain and not loss, good and not evil, success and not failure, in order that I shall not regret the price I paid for it. And I love that quote because, it, once again, it reminds me that uh, today is God's gift to me. Today, I get to choose how I'm going to live my life. I get to decide how I'm going to spend my coin. I talked about earlier. Every day I wake up, I want to, you know, I tell people, when your alarm goes off, you can choose to rise and shine or you can choose to rise and whine. 
And I don't want to be a whiner because whiners don't make a positive impact in this world. So I want to shine because the other thing my faith tells me, Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your father who is in heaven. And that's exactly whether I'm in a costume or not in a costume. That's what I hope to accomplish in life is to let my light shine. Not so that people look at me, but the people look and realize that God is good and he is faithful. And I'm just grateful to be on this journey, the ups, the downs, and the good days, not so good days. You know, it's just, just fun to be able to be on this journey and see what he's got next for me. Yeah. Well, thank you for spending today with us. It's, um, I keep saying inspirational, but I'm glad that you're continuing to shine and glad to have met you and God well, bless you. Well, I appreciate you, you all having me on and uh, look forward to next time our paths cross. Me too. Happy landings, Dan. All right. Have a great day. Wow. I hope that message reaches you right where you are. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend. If it's not your cup of tea, well, thanks for listening to our very first podcast. Sincerely. And if the verdict is still out, maybe you want to explore future episodes, then head on over to Thrill.show and sign up for the newsletter so that we can let you know when those new episodes come out. Coming up next... We'll have a conversation with Jeff Walker about the Caesars Palace job, about our impending move to Las Vegas, Nevada. He's a super guy, and you'll enjoy getting to know him as much as I do. I'll see you all then.